We're real excited to have all the people here. Um, I don't know which way you go across on your screen. Courtney Beebe, she is on the commission. John Mueller, uh, going around here. Hillary Anderson, she's with the city. Yeah, Shauna is our, our right hand. Lisa Straza, she is on the committee. Uh, Ali Marino is on the committee. And we might have a couple. And then from the city down there, it sounds like Walter's down there. So uh, we're pretty good shape and we're glad to have you here. Um, this kind of started about a year and a half ago when the city decided, hey, cities, as we look to the future, we've got all these things that we have to manage, you know, transportation and infrastructure and schools and hospitals and everything else. But as a city grows, and as so many cities around the country, including Wallace recently, uh, has taken a, a historic preservation plan. And so for the city to take a stand, so, and our mission is, as the, the Historic Preservation Committee, is to come up with a community um, founded uh, information and some documents and some ways to look at things to set uh, a future plan that will actually eventually be presented to the city council and then be a part of the city's uh, codes. So it's kind of exciting to uh, be here. Um, I've lived here for 65 years. Uh, as well as John Mueller, we've known each other since uh, since Sunday school way back. And he like I, it, it's just it's real exciting to be a part of this. I've seen so many things disappear. Um, one of the things, and it took us a while to figure out where we're going. We had great help uh, with a guy named Pete Larange down in Boise, and he's with SHPO, which is State Historical Preservation Group. Um, and as we formed. We uh, came up and get, put an RFP out, got uh, made a contract with uh, some awesome people, Northwest Vernacular, um, and it's Katie Pratt and Spencer Howard, and they're on here with us. And they've done this, and I brought up Wallace because they just helped Wallace complete their um, historic preservation plan. Um, Katie's got roots in Lewiston and uh, Spencer's a Northwest guy. So, and they've done stuff like this and are real excited and everything that the committee has seen so far, we were so excited to get to this. And this is super, super important to me um, as being a, a lifetime involved citizen, this meeting to have our, our community show up and it's so lovely to see your, fa your faces and names on here. And this is exciting because this is how really good things happen in our community is with input from public. And so thank you very much from here. Um, I'm the commissioner, that's why I did, uh, what am I, the chairman of the commission? <laughs> so I think that's really kind of go from there and I'm just gonna let go, be, the, the people that really know what they're doing are gonna take it over, but welcome and thank you so much for attending. All right, thank you so much, David. Um, uh, I'm Katie Pratt, and then uh, Spencer Howard, my colleague, is also on the line. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and we're going to run through a presentation with you guys. Um, so bear with me. I'm not always the best at tech stuff. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Phew. Okay, um, so as David said, uh, Spencer and I were Northwest Vernacular and we're a historic preservation consulting firm. Uh, and tonight we're gonna spend some time talking about what historic preservation is, uh, asking for some live feedback from attendees and providing an opportunity for a question and answer session at the end. Um, we would ask that everyone have their microphones on mute just so we don't have background noise or feedback coming through. Um, and we'll be using the polls feature uh, in Zoom to ask questions throughout the meeting. And Shanna and Hillary with this video will be helping us facilitate that. Uh, so when the poll is launched, it'll pop up on your screen and we'll ask you to select an answer and then we'll close the poll and chat about the results, okay? So, um, just as a quick note, the preparation of the historic preservation plan for the city, including this meeting, has been funded with the assistance of a matching grant in, in aid from the Idaho State Preser Historic Preservation Office uh, and the Historic Preservation Fund through the National Park Service. So what is historic preservation? It's a movement in planning that seeks to preserve older buildings and areas 
recognizing inherent value uh, and also provides a way to tie a place's history to its population and culture. And the core parts of this process are identify, evaluate, educate, and nominate. Uh, identify, we can't preserve historic places unless we know what and where they are. Uh, evaluate, it's important to know the story, the history and the context of these places so we can know why and how they should be preserved. Uh, educate, once we know the story, it's important to share it with the community so they can know it too. Uh, and that efforts to preserve and understand historic places um, are community driven. And then finally nominate, uh, this part of historic preservation is giving properties the distinction of being considered officially historic. Uh, the National Register of Historic Places is the nation's list of historically significant objects, sites, buildings, and structures, and it's maintained by the National Park Service. And the National Register is completely honorific uh, and does not carry any protection, but it also doesn't in interfere with any private property rights. So in discussing these four qualities of historic preservation movement, identify, evaluate, educate, nominate. Um, this is where a historic preservation plan comes into play. It's a planning document that develops a vision for historic preservation in the city and a series of goals, policies, and actions that will help the city pursue that vision. Now is a great time for Coeur d'Alene to create a historic preservation plan because its city's historic preservation program is new and a plan will help build momentum. Uh, and it also uh, provides an opportunity for the public public to comment on the direction of the program through meetings like this. Uh, and also there's a community survey that has been circulating and uh, at the end of the meeting, we can post that in the chat if you haven't been able to participate in that yet. Um, and ultimately the historic preservation plan will lay out recommendations on how to identify, evaluate, educate, and nominate historic properties uh, within Coeur d'Alene. So with that, we're gonna go to the first poll. Uh, how familiar are you with historic preservation on a scale of very familiar to not familiar at all? Okay. Shanna and Hillary, have we had- it's Still coming in, yeah, sorry. Oh, you can't perfect. see the live ones, but I looks like we have 15 of the 21 people are have participated, so 71% have voted. Great. Yeah, anyone else wanna weigh in or you? Okay, we'll close that poll. Let me copy that really fast so we have it for our records. <laughs> Multitasking here. Okay. <clears throat> All right, can you see, let's see here, share the results. Can you see that? There we go. Okay, great. Um, so about a third of you guys that participated are very familiar, but half of you are only somewhat familiar uh, and uh, just over 10% are not familiar at all. So this is, this is great. I'm glad that you guys are all here so you can become even more familiar with what historic preservation is uh, and how it is connected with Coeur d'Alene. Um, so thank you, Hillary uh, and Shannon. We'll go on to the next slide. Okay, so what is historic? This is a term. <laughs> Uh, that's pretty challenging. Uh, it's a word, we use it a lot, like, oh, that's historic, that's old. Um, and there are a couple different meanings as to what historic is. There's uh, what's defined as historic within the city's preservation ordinance. Um, but then there's also what we consider to be historic and that's usually anything that we consider to be older than ourselves, right? Um, but the general guideline used by the National Park Service, uh, which is the entity that uh, historic preservation pro professionals look to for guidance, they say that um, a historic property is anything that's 50 years or older, um, unless it has uh, exceptional significance. Uh, so for example, like um, the Space Needle in Seattle was landmarked before it was 50 years old because everyone recognized how significant it was. Um, but in addition to being at least 50 years old, we also wanna think about does it have physical integrity, uh, the location of it? Has it been moved? Um, and it's not that it has to have everything uh, within those boxes of integrity, but you know it needs to um, have a significant amount of integrity still um, so that it can convey its significance, that it looks like a historic place. Uh, that's really what matters. 
Okay, so the next uh, poll is what is your favorite historic place in Coeur d'Alene? The poll feature only allows us to do multiple choice. So I'm sure that there are more than what we've offered here. So if you select other, cause there's a special place that you think should be considered, please add it to the chat um, so that we can get some more of that feedback. Okay, results are coming in. Oh, that's good. Are we getting anything in the chat? Are people writing anything in, Spencer? We do have, yes, there's one question in there. One question about the survey. Um, okay. But no, uh, no particular places though. Okay, great. Okay. And oh, fantastic. Okay, City Park and Beach, that's wonderful. Um, Gosh, it's not, the federal building was not selected. Maybe it's called by something different or people don't uh, recognize it, but this is great that you guys all recognized um, so many of these places. Um, and I love that the park and the beach um, because it's a, such an important gathering place that that's prominent in your guys' minds. I think that's wonderful. Okay. Oops, sorry. And while you're doing that, one place that came up on the chat was the Battery Railway Building, where the Human Rights Education Institute is located. Oh, I'm sorry. I've moved ahead on my PowerPoint here That's accidentally. Okay. Now I have to figure out how to get back. Nope. Here we go. There we go. OK, sorry about that. OK, so how does this all connect into a historic preservation plan? Uh, basically, Every community is different and has their own priorities and values. And what works in one city will not necessarily work in another city. So we wanna understand how the public perceives historic preservation and history so we can shape the goals and policies for the city's historic preservation program in a way that fits the city. So the basic parts of a historic preservation plan are the vision and mission, and then the goals, policies, and action items that support that vision, vision and mission. And then we also include the historic context as well as architectural styles and property types um, because understanding how the city was developed is really important to understanding what historic resources are there, why they might be important. Um, so that kind of serves as the foundation for everything else within the document. And a vision statement is capturing what community members value about their community's heritage and the long-term role they want historic preservation to have in shaping the character and growth of their community. Uh, and the mission statement is directly connected to that vision statement, describing how the city's historic preservation program will work to support the city and then achieving that vision. And goals are the broadly based statements intended to set forth the general principles that express the priorities of the community uh, and guide public policy to support the mission and achieve the long-term vision. Policies are guidelines to integrate historic preservation into city decision-making in order to reach the goals by supporting coordinated development. And then action items are the possible courses of action available to the city, the Historic Preservation Commission, and stakeholders to implement policies and achieve the goals. Oh. So I thought I would share an example goal from another project we worked on. Uh, we did the historic preservation plan for the city of Candy, which is in Oregon. Um, and one of the goals that we created for them was to uh, utilize historic preservation to inform city decision-making, which seems pretty straightforward. Uh, but in Canby, there was uh, a lot of um, people didn't know what historic preservation was. The program had been a while, around for a while. It had lost momentum and the departments weren't really talking to each other. Uh, so we thought that was really important to get the city on track in terms of thinking about historic preservation and how it works uh, throughout the city and with different departments. And so then a policy that supports that goal is to ensure new construction and development reinforces the historic character of the city. 
uh, in Candy, they have a lot of vacant lots downtown and uh, they had design guidelines, um, but they kind of didn't necessarily match up with the historic character of the city. So we thought a policy that they could put forward was in order to maintain that small town charm, which is something that we heard very frequently in our conversations with the public, was to ensure that this new construction that's going in because they want vacant lots infilled, they don't want just blank lots everywhere, um, but to make sure that it uh, is compatible with the rest of the downtown so it feels like you're in Canby um, and not just anywhere else uh, in the state. And so that uh, a sample action item that we had from to support those that goal and that policy uh, was to encourage compatible infill within key downtown corridors, um, highlighting specific places where they might want to focus on, but also looking at uh, revising their design guidelines so that they could think about new construction in a way that worked well with the historic buildings that are existing. Um, even though those historic buildings spanned a number of periods and architectural styles, but what were those uh, traits that seemed to be common throughout the downtown area that could be incorporated in new buildings? So for example, like in Coeur d'Alene, you're walking down Sherman Avenue downtown, there's something about being able to see into storefronts or that pedestrian experience and wanting that aspect to continue in any new construction that would go in instead of having a new building that went up uh, that was like blank walls where you know the entrance was in the back. And so there wasn't that historic pedestrian experience that you would have experienced downtown. Uh, the core premise is that the city's historic development patterns inform policy and new development. And so while a preservation plan is not set up to survey the entire city, uh, we've been looking at published histories, uh, National Register listed properties in those nominations and previous survey work to establish the framework of development periods, looking at different building forms and functions and then prominent architectural styles within the city. And this enables other city planning and future survey work to build on the same structure so that they can inform one another instead of everything kind of happening in their own silo or not working together. And we've found um, this works really well in communities because we've done plans in Canby uh, and McMinnville in Oregon, and both of those plans have followed up with survey work based on the guidelines uh, within the historic preservation plan. And then you know, we've been lucky to be able to do some of those surveys. We didn't have to start from scratch um, in starting the research or what's been going on. We were able to look at the historic preservation plan and understand why this area was identified for survey work and how we could build off of work that's already been done, which I think is really helpful and it makes all the work that the program does uh, make sense. Uh, and so after this, we're gonna have uh, a little trivia. I thought it would be fun to have some architectural style questions um, to quiz everyone to see what they think uh, these buildings might be. Because uh, it's it's challenging, right, to uh, guess architectural style. So we're going to put up a poll. Um, and if you can tell me what architectural style you think this is. Um, and all of these photos are older. I got them from National Register nominations. Um, so if you recognize the property and it looks different today, that's why. Okay, so are we getting some answers in on this one? We are, they're slowly coming in. Okay. Okay. All right. Here what do people is. think? There you go. Craftsman. Excellent. You are correct, most of you. That's wonderful. This I started with an easy one, I think, or I tried to. Um, so the craftsman architectural style emerged from the arts and crafts movement, uh, which was a design movement that gained popularity in the US through the work of Gustav Stickley, who was a furniture designer and publisher of Craftsman magazine. And these craftsman style houses are typically one to one and a half stories, that craftsman bungalow that we all think of. Um, they're characterized by low pitched roofs, asymmetrical facades, 
uh, porches with tapered or square, squared piers, which you can see on this building right here. Um, there's also exposed or decorative structural members like those knee braces under the eaves. Uh, and wood is the most common building material on craftsman houses. Um, but you might see stone and brick, um, especially clinker brick uh, used on porch supports and chimneys. Okay, here's the next one, 315 East Wallace. And I believe this has had an addition on it since this photograph was taken. All right, answers are trickling in, I'm sure. Yes, they are. <laughs> Get some good responses. Yes, and we're waiting for Walter to vote. I'm like, <laughs> Commissioner, we need comment. Yeah. Oh, you're waiting for me? Oh, no. No, for Walter. There you go. Oh. <laughs> All right. We'll share the results. <laughs> Queen Anne. Okay. That is interesting. I can see why a lot of you would think that it's Queen Anne. Um, because of that front porch uh, and the rounded window, but it's Colonial Revival. Um, and let me uh, chat about why that is. Um, so if you look at the side elevation in particular with those dormers and that uh, bay window, it sort of makes a little bit more sense. But Colonial Revival takes its inspiration from the architecture constructed by English colonists during the 17th century. Um, it applies to a number of building types. It was incredibly popular for residential construction. And some of those characteristics of colonial revival that we'll see on this um, house in particular, it has a symmetrical facade, classical cornices, which you can see, let me get my cursor over here, has these eave returns too. Um, and then uh, it has a highlighted entrance with this large front porch and then the uh, arched window above it and then uh, double hung windows. And also you can see here, here's a good giveaway um, that it's not Queen Anne and it's uh, Colonial Revival is it has the rounded columns with those capitals and then it has this dental work here at the front porch whereas the Queen Anne house would have um, more elaborate kind of scroll work and less of that kind of classical appearance that we think of with Colonial Revival. But great guess, I could see why you guys would say that. It's a tricky one. Okay, here's the next one, the Masonic Temple at 524 East Sherman. Well, Sherman. Results are coming in still. Okay, great. I know, I feel like I need to have like background music, like the Jeopardy song. I know. When, right, when everyone's <laughs> doing Final well, Jeopardy, that would be perfect. I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Exactly. Okay, share those results for you. Renaissance Survival, that was 41%. And then everyone was kind of split between uh, new formalism and Georgian revival. I'm glad no one picked Prairie. Good choice. Um, it's Renaissance revival. Let me chat about why that is. Um, so Renaissance revival, it's also called Second Renaissance revival or Italian Renaissance revival, um, is inspired by 14th and 15th century Italian palazzos. Um, and it's primarily used on commercial and civic buildings. So that makes sense with the Masonic temple. Um, they typically feature rectangular plans and symmetrical facades. Masonry or stone exterior walls are common uh, with cast stone or terracotta detailing. And uh, other common features include rusticated uh, ground floor levels, which is what this is down here. You can see that the um, stone material has a more rustic appearance versus the brick that looks smooth up above. Um, there's elaborate uh, belt courses, arched windows, um, and flat roofs hidden by highly ornate cornices, which we can see 
up here, like the roof's sheltered by this almost balustrade with paneling and then a really detailed cornice with dentals, um, an interesting frieze. All right. And this is our last one, St. Thomas Catholic Church on East Indiana. I love this building. It's so beautiful. I tried to trick you with uh, multiple revival options because it all runs together. <laughs> Results are coming in still. <laughs> Great. All right, there are the results. Romanesque revival. Excellent job, you guys, you got it right. Um, so Romanesque revival uh, originated in Europe in the early uh, 19th century. Uh, buildings in this style are based on medieval and early Christian Romanesque cathedrals of the 11th and 12th centuries. Um, and common features of this style in the US are molded um, semicircular arches for windows and door openings. So you'll see the vegetation is kind of blocking on this photo. Um, it also has molded belt courses uh, that divide the exterior into horizontal bands, which we can see right here. Uh, Lombard uh, band, which is a series of miniature arches located below the eaves. So we can see that here. So they're just recessed arches versus ones for doorways or windows. Um, column capitals uh, and compound arches enriched with geometric medieval or Byzantine inspired ornament versus um, the sort of uh, crenellation or tracer that we would see on uh, Gothic revival. You'll see gabled roofs flanked by square or polygonal towers of differing heights and capped with pyr pyramidal roofs, which we see here on this steeple. Um, and then you'll see broad um, smooth wall surfaces of monochromatic brick. Um, so, which we can see uh, right here is great. Oh, well, thank you guys for playing uh, our trivia with architectural styles. And I um, know this hasn't been uh, a long presentation, but Spencer's gonna talk about um, next steps. And then we wanted to spend a significant portion uh, with questions and uh, answer sessions. So if you have questions, feel free to add them into the chat if you haven't done so already. Um, and Spencer will talk about next steps and then we'll get to those questions. Great, thank you, Katie. Um, as you might expect, uh, this type of plan goes through multiple stages of review. Um, we're looking at April 30th to be able to have the first draft submitted and then September 1st of 2021 to have the final submitted. And in between both of those, there's going to be another public meeting um, we've been looking at between May or June, but as we get further into 2021, we'll know what that is. And then um, that will be um, uh, uh, advertised publicly. So everybody has an opportunity uh, to know about that meeting. That meeting too will then go over the findings, recommendations. So we'll have a lot more information to present at that next meeting. Um, I think two also, to remember on this is that the, the, the drafts as they go through review are getting reviewed, by, that'll come out to the public, uh, the Historic Preservation Commission, uh, city staff, uh, as well as the uh, SHPO will be reviewing. So there'll be a lot of um, edits to kind of coordinate as we work through those. Since this is a kickoff meeting, um, we really wanted to listen to you um, other than kind of providing the context. Um, so, one item is that the um, the survey, which in the chat is at the very top, that is still open and, and will remain open this month. And so we would really encourage people to participate in that. And if you know anyone else who might be interested, um, please forward it to them and encourage them to participate. It really helps 
to get more public input, um, just hearing what people um, interests, concerns, um, thoughts are uh, definitely helps. Um, and so I think with that, uh, we'll go into kind of a question and answer period. And as Hillary um, posted on the chat and just jumped around, um, if uh, anybody has any questions to put them into the chat, I think we can also raise hands on here as well too, if people want to speak it. The um, first question that we have is, does Coeur d'Alene have a particularly prominent architectural style? And I'm not sure, Katie, do you have any um, insight on that? I've just started um, working on that um, aspect of the history. I got um, Robert Singletary's book and I was reading that uh, this morning and we'll continue to read it, which is a wonderful history. Um, and I haven't yet um, identified if there's a particular style yet, um, but I, if you know of places, please like let us know, and especially in the survey that there's um, spots for um, comment, not just multiple choice answers, that would be really helpful. Um, so we're, we're working on that and we'll include that in um, the draft of the plan, absolutely. The next question that we have on the chat is is there any downside to forming historic preservation? And um, so kind of two parts to that. Uh, one is no, <laughs> um, but uh, truly, um, so one, uh, you already have a uh, historic preservation code. So the city of Coeur d'Alene has already committed to becoming a certified local government. And that is an effort to um, basically assert that um, the city's history and character is important, um, both for the sense of place for people living in Coeur d'Alene and also as an economic component for the city going forward. Uh, so in that context, um, no, everything that you're set up with currently is basically structured around information, uh, being able to inform your planning processes, being able to inform interpretive and um, uh, economic um, processes. So um, no, there isn't. And typically we see with um, certified local governments when they do get to the point where they decide to establish a local register, which then typically comes with um, controls and protections and design review, um, that those are typically require owner consent. So it's not something that gets applied to people um, without their consent. Um, but for property owners who do have a property and want to have that protected going forward, it provides them a mechanism um, for that. And it also gives the um, Historic Preservation Commission in the city an opportunity to comment on environmental under undertakings or larger scale undertakings that can have an effect on the uh, quality of life and character um, for citizens within Coeur d'Alene. Um, the next question that we have are, what are some ways that the city of Wallace historic preservation plan was successful? Um, your plan is still in draft. Um, uh, we have, um, you haven't gotten to that point to know whether it's successful or not. Um, we do hope that it will be successful. Um, I think kind of looking forward on that, uh, things that we would look for, um, look to happen um, kind of out of a historic preservation plan is that it provides a um, kind of a, a work plan for the Historic Preservation Commission for them to uh, participate in city decision making, um, undertake additional survey work within the city to collect a different in additional information, um, work with neighborhoods to um, both survey and if there's neighborhood interests, um, support them in designation. So it provides that, uh, hopefully will provide that, uh, that information um, pathway. And um, for other policy work that's happening within the city concurrent to this, such as your comprehensive plan update and the core housing code, um, ideally it will provide a, um, a mechanism for historic preservation to be integrated within those other elements. I would add to Spencer, if that's okay. Um, not specific to the city of Wallace, but in thinking of some examples from other preservation plans that we've done, 
that were a few years old. So they've been adopted by city council and implemented and they've started using them. Um, a great example is McMinnville. They did an additional survey, um, but also what, as part of their uh, historic preservation plan, they did an intensive level survey. And um, I got a phone call like right before Christmas from someone who just bought a house that had been surveyed and they found our survey report and the historic preservation plan. And so then they were able to learn about um, incentives that were available in the state of Oregon for them to do uh, rehab work and find resources on how they might sensitively um, update their house. Um, and then they were able to find ways that they could learn more about their house. And so that's more at the like individual property owner level. But so I think that's what's really wonderful about this kind of um, plan is that it can be accessible. It is a planning document, but elements of it can be accessible to the broader public as well. Great. Um, the next question that we have is, how much do we know about our current landmark or historical properties that are also of historical value to the state. For instance, uh, the HREI building is one of only two uh, in the state left. Um, so there's a couple things to kind of unpack from that. Um, the city of Coeur d'Alene currently doesn't have a, a city register. Um, so you don't have a landmark properties, but there are properties that have been listed to the National Register within the city of Coeur d'Alene. Um, and so those, their nominations do, um, typically I haven't gone through all of them, but basically the basis for those is that they, they do demonstrate their value to the state, um, depending on what level of significance they're listed at. Um, typically properties will be listed at the local, state, or national level of significance in a National Register nomination. And, that relates to the context that their sort of um, their role, their significance um, is evaluated in. So if it's local, it's in the context of the city, generally speaking. If it's state, then it's looking at other statewide comparatives. And if it's national, then it's looking at other national um, comparatives. And each of those involves a lot more research and work to be able to find those comparatives and to be able to do that. Um, so you do have it established. I'm not familiar with the HREI building, um, but we will definitely look that building up as we're doing our work. Um, next question. What sort of encouragement will there be for commercial building owners to preserve their historic buildings? or restore buildings to a former appearance? That's a great question. Um, that, yeah, we're working through that right now and we're trying to figure out uh, what pathways there might be for that. The, the typical one is through the Federal Historic Rehabilitation Tax Credits, but that's complicated in two ways. One, the expenditure threshold, basically the amount of money that you have to spend to be able to qualify qualify for that project is pretty high. Um, it's 100% of the um, adjusted basis of just the building. The other part is that you have to be listed to the National Register to be able to qualify. You can be contributing to a district or you can be individually listed, um, but that, kind of implies that going into this, your building already has a pretty high level of integrity, architectural character, original character that remains. So those can be difficult um, kind of hurdles for um, property owners to, um, uh, to kind of get over. Um, historic districts, especially commercial historic districts are a great mechanism for supporting that because the integrity requirements for the individual buildings are a little bit lower than if you were just designating a single building. So that can help quite a bit. Um, but we're looking at it and we're looking um, uh, statewide. There are some other programs that other cities are using such as facade grant programs um, and, and mechanisms to try and potentially help bring back some character or, or remove intrusive elements. So 
Um, so we don't have an answer now, but we will, and we are definitely working on that. Uh, next question. And uh, we have a question on here that Hillary, uh, Kevin would like to make a comment if he could. Yes, if um, Kevin, you wanna unmute and then you can yep. make a comment. Okay, I'm, I'm unmuted, I believe. Can everybody hear me? Okay, I saw a head nod, yes. so. Um, the question I have is, um, you know, with the event that happened yesterday, the windstorm, one of the things that happened down in the old neighborhood here, the old Fort Brown is, there was about four homes that were severely damaged with falling trees. Um, you know, we're not certified as historic uh, preservation yet. So this is a question maybe for the future. And that would be in the future for homes that might see something like this happen to them unforeseen to reconstruct um, them in the style and character of the original home, will there be incentives for doing that? So it's just, it's a, it's a question that I have and I, I needed to state it rather than write it down because obviously you can tell it was more than just a sentence. So thank you very much. Thank you, that's helpful. Uh, we will look at that. Um, and that's helpful to think of it with regards to residences, single family, multiple family. Um, I think typically we look at incentives and think a lot more around commercial buildings. So thank you. And we can also look to see what other communities, because uh, obviously there are areas of the country that experience natural disasters um, fairly frequently um, and they have historic communities too. So we can uh, look to see if there are some examples of uh, historic communities throughout the nation that uh, maybe have plans in place because they regularly have to deal with this and see if that might be applicable um, just so the city has it in its back pocket or knows where to look for information. Very good, thank you. So going down the next question is, I know in some areas there is encouragement for certain historic districts to have a cohesive look that is appropriate to the district. Is there any sort of plan down the road to explore this? Um, so the, um, I'm trying to think about how to unpack this. Um, that will typically, so looking, um, the cohesive character typically stems from the um, historic architectural character of the neighborhood. Um, neighborhoods, if they are designated as a historic district or even if they've just been surveyed, the goal is to typically identify um, what are the development periods, the, the periods in which that neighborhood um, grew and developed into its current form. And what are the common um, or kind of prevailing architectural styles, building forms, materials that are character defining to those different development periods? And then you would typically look at what's the period of significance for that neighborhood. Um, and this will relate to the development periods and will typically tie into the first oldest house that's built. Um, and then the kind of ending house on the other end of that range as to when the end of whatever significant activities that contribute to the historical importance of that neighborhood ended. Um, so you can have neighborhoods, for example, that um, like if they're tied to uh, big population booms like in the 1910s, 1920s, and then had huge amounts of growth and development. And then that really tapered off and then really didn't see a lot of growth or development until maybe like the 1950s, 60s, 70s type of thing. And you might be looking at that initial period of significance up through the 1920s. So that kind of a nutshell is the, the mechanism for looking at how do you define the historic character? The second part of that then is is there neighborhood interest in um, a historic district? And so if there is, then pursuing that, uh, that designation. Um, in order to um, 
kind of uh, manage both new construction and work on existing buildings, a historic district would typically have to be listed to a local register. And then it would typically have to have design guidelines um, that are set up specifically for that district that address the, um, the periods of sig significance, the um, development periods, and those character defining materials and architectural styles and types. Um, and so then that provides that framework for protecting the character of that neighborhood. Um, but that all requires the property owners to be um, on the same page in terms of wanting that and, and wanting to carry that forward and, and having that interest in protecting the neighborhood. But so I guess kind of in the end, it, it's um, survey work helps you to identify it. So at least you know what's there and potentially through city policy can help inform compatible development in that way. Local designation and design guidelines are what protect existing buildings within there to the greatest degree. Um, the next question. Um, is there any funding for brass plaques and or other signage for people to post on their home or historic building? Um, something that keeps continuity with identity, identifying the structure. Um, typically, um, no, usually there isn't um, any funding directly for brass plaques, but that's something where if there's a community interest in it, that may be something that the city, um, there, there may be a mechanism internal to the city to be able to support that. Um, it may also be something where the design and a vendor locally that could be able to produce those, um, it, it, that there's some kind of standardization of that to provide that continuity, which could make it uh, less cost prohibitive to be able to have new ones made. Um, but knowing that there's interest in that is helpful. We've seen that in, um, I say quite a few cities um, having those plaques and having a little bit of information on the buildings and that can be very informative and um, especially to like in the city of Olympia uh, in Washington state, they had their historic shoreline move quite a bit. So they put plaques where the shoreline used to be. So sometimes even marking places that no longer exist helps people to remember um, where things used to be and um, those relationships. The next question is, with the influx of new development in Coeur d'Alene, how can historic preservation aid in the development or design of new properties so they can reflect the historic character or nature of the area? Um, it can help through, um, typically through survey and inventory, uh, identifying what the historic character of an area is um, and being able to being able to provide a mechanism where that information is um, either set up or communicated to um, within city policies so that it's usable. Um, yeah, I say that and and it's the what makes sense in historic preservation often does not make sense to um, uh, um, uh, building code um, and uh, um, design um, entities. And so it's making part of the preservation plan is trying to trying to help package the information that's collected and is also available through historic preservation efforts into a language and a form that other departments in the city can understand is not quite the right word, but but utilize and, and really efficiently be able to apply. Um, so I think that that probably not the greatest answer, but there, that's kind of the underlying intent. Yeah, I think just to tag, tap onto what Spencer was saying that um, 
Historic preservation often is siloed within cities. It's its own little office, if it even has a full-time staff member. And so um, what we are trying to do with the historic preservation plan um, and what we've done in other communities is try to help um, people see that historic preservation can fit in really well with other departments within the city. And it works really well. Like historic preservation is naturally sustainable. So if you're talking about environmental practices and whatnot, historic preservation is a great conversation to have with that larger conversation. So trying to figure out ways that historic preservation can be tied into other conversations already happening within the city um, so that it's not like an afterthought, but more preservations at the table already. Um, that's really the main goal um, so that it can help support um, other things going on in the city, even if you, it's not the driving force for things. I think that's important. The uh, next question that we had is, can you clarify the difference between preservation and interpretation? Katie, do you wanna do? Or? Yes, I can do that. Um, that's a great qu question. Um, so when we talk about his historic preservation, uh, we're often just talking about kind of the nuts and bolts of we have historic sites, objects, buildings, and structures, and we want them to remain, right? Um, but oftentimes what's lacking in historic preservation is interpretation. And that's where other entities within the community, like the um, Museum of North Idaho is great. Um, and thinking about uh, how can we utilize the built environment uh, and interpret the built environment to tell the communities uh, stories. And so we uh, will definitely include within the plan ideas or connections that the city can make um, to do that because that connects in with that idea that we were talking about earlier of uh, education uh, and interpretation is a key part of education because um, not everyone wants to go to a lecture and learn about something or a house tour. And so those are great things. Um, but wanting to have a range of ideas and interpretation encompasses a bunch of things um, so that people are excited about historic places uh, in Coeur d'Alene so that they, they go together. Because um, oftentimes preservation programs can forget the interpretation part. And I think they, they don't always go together, but they should uh, to be really uh, meaningful. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, the next question is, how are infill policies such as core housing addressed in the historic preservation plan? Um, so we're addressing those under the um, under zoning, and we've been going through the um, the, the draft, um, sort of the successive iterations of the draft um, language around core housing and the presentations. And we've been looking at the um, citywide GIS layers that show the kind of um, the different um, zones. Uh, for how those would extend out over the city. And we've been looking at how those zones relate to previous survey work, listed buildings, as well as the underlying building stock. Um, so we've been looking at, you know, what are the types of um, buildings in those areas? What's the relative age of those buildings? And how does that compare? Um, we've also been looking at kind of the mechanics of that process too in terms of um, what if any communication is there and what role would that um, or connection would there be for the Historic Preservation Commission core housing? Um, how does it function within the city? So infill housing and, and new construction are kind of odd items because broadly speaking, they, they really um, don't get reviewed in the same way as, as changes to historic buildings by historic preservation commissions. And you currently don't have a design review mechanism um, with your historic preservation code to do that. But there are mechanisms within the core housing code to establish um, standards, um, neighborhood character, um, design characteristics. And so what we're looking at trying to figure out some ways of doing is how to communicate the information from historic preservation specific to, neighbor, to particular neighborhoods into the um, uh, design uh, into language that then the design review commission 
um, with the city would be able to utilize as they're reviewing uh, proposed infill housing development. Um, so it's, in a nutshell, we're trying to make sure the entities doing the review have the information about historic character so they can um, have, make better informed decisions when they're reviewing and, um, and really have something that's quantifiable to point to, to say, you know, this is that character for this neighborhood based on this work that's been done. Um, I have a question, uh, what can we do to support and encourage this program? Um, fill out the, uh, the survey uh, is a great way. Um, participate in uh, Historic Preservation uh, Commission meetings. Um, those especially too, while we're kind of living in a virtual world, that can be a little easier. You can have it on and have it in the background. And um, I've served on Historic Preservation Commission in, in uh, Seattle and Pike Place Market. And, and um, it's always delightful to have people show up from the public, um, even if nobody has anything to say or any questions, but you feel like you're not just talking to an empty room and, and uh, that that there is community interest. So um, to the degree that you have time and, and interest, being able to participate in that. Um, the other is, um, is I think out of the historic preservation plan, the um, some of the recommendations that we'll have in there for survey and inventory and for future work, um, you know, looking at those and seeing how those overlap with, um, with where you reside or where you work in the city of Coeur d'Alene and to the degree that you support or are interested in those, um, uh, reaching out to the Historic Preservation Commission to encourage um, progress on those and, and for those things to be, um, to be moved forward. And I would add on to what Spencer said with thinking about um, future work that comes up um, as a result of the Historic Preservation Plan, if there's volunteer opportunities. Um, for example, Spencer and I are working on a survey right now um, that's just a reconnaissance level survey. So we're not doing in-depth research, but there is a resident who loves to do the research. And so she's uh, looking at the city directories for us and the census data. And so it's not within our contract, but because she's willing to do the volunteer work and the legwork for us and pull historic photographs, we're able to enhance the work that we're able to provide um, on a you know a tighter budget than it would have been for us to do all of that work, um, and so that's always really great when there's opportunities like that if people can volunteer, um, especially if you know that that's something you're good at um, in like doing that kind of research or you know where the, all the historic photos are and you want to be able to provide that or you have a historic photograph of a house that's being surveyed, sharing that, being willing to do that, that kind of stuff is. Uh, incredibly helpful and um, it just naturally makes it easier to talk about it too if you're personally um, involved with the work and being able to share that with your family and friends and coworkers. Great. Do we have any other questions? Ah, we do. <clears throat> uh, many of these programs are chronically underfunded. What other funding ideas are being looked into? Um, yeah, uh, we're looking at other grant programs. Um, we're trying to, um, like Idaho, the Idaho Heritage Trust has a great grant program. Um, uh, too big. Um, so there's kind of a running list of grant programs and we're going through those to try and figure out which ones match up with the city of Coeur d'Alene and your resources and then matching those with the types of projects that they would be able to fund. Um, there's some grants that are uh, related to historic preservation, but specific to the size of a city. And then there's others that will do planning work, um, but there's others that will only do brick and mortar type work. So it's kind of sorting all of that out and, um, and being able to include that. But the um, historic preservation plan will have a section um, dedicated to financial incentives to be able to go through those. If I can jump in just for a moment, just for you out there that don't know, um, we actually, 
as we became a local government uh, committee with the city of Coeur d'Alene and hooked up with the state historic Pres preservation, there's actually a program that our nine committee members are on here. Anytime that we're in a meeting or researching things, um, we actually get a little credit for this. It's kind of, it, they don't pay us, but better yet, that money goes in. And that's kind of where this started with a seed to get to get people on and you know put us in the position that we are today with katie and spencer and getting this far so there's a little bit of funding that kind of comes through the state and i'm not sure how all the government entities work on that but there's a little bit in there that's kind of always as long as we're working on it we're making a couple of bucks to go to the right course too as well so just wanted to kind of add that for you um i saw the follow-up question about looking more at the local level of funding rather than grants um, as that also includes community participation. And we are looking at examples in other communities of how they're able to fund facade improvements, because um, obviously that will take city council buy-in to create a funding source, um, whether that's a mechanism to get funds or if they're willing to set aside portions of the budget. So that all depends on um, the uh, what city council is okay with. And so that's where also community participation can come in and uh, talking to your council members and letting them know that historic preservation matters and that you would like to see um, funding sources to help historic properties. That's always a value. Um, but yeah, we're definitely trying to look at other communities that are similar in size to Coeur d'Alene or similar, because um, you got tourism is so important in Coeur d'Alene, looking at other cities and how they've leveraged um, historic preservation money uh, to maintain their areas. Like thinking about, for example, like Walla Walla with their wine industry, like their historic downtown, they have a main street program and what kind of funding they've been able to get. And maybe they as a nonprofit entity, if they're able to distribute funds as well. So looking at um, examples like that and being able to, I mean, we can't solve everything, but provide a roadmap um, so that um, the city and other entities can, um, follow those kind of trails um, to find funding sources or create funding sources. Do we have any other questions? Well, I guess as a chair, I'll jump back in here. Um, uh, thanks, James. Thanks. You know what? Uh, it's, it's great. We've had a solid 23, 24 people on here this evening. And obviously by our COVID constrictions and the Zooming world that we are in, we're really happy to see the names and the faces pop up here. And the one thing I guess I would want to send you home with, oh, you're already at home, never mind. Uh, yes, that, you know, I'm really happy that you're concerned about this. Just talk about it with your friends. Next time you sit down for coffee or beer, it's like, hey, the other night I was on here, this is what I learned. Follow us, um, you know, the city on, on Facebook. The, there'll always be information out there. Uh, hopefully that's where most of you caught that. When you see these things, share them. Uh, share the link with your friends. Go find that. Um, it's kind of like the uh, Fort Sherman, you know, uh, started off uh, yesterday when, you know, it got hit there at uh, the Little Red Chapel. Um a funding start got started and I shared it with some friends and they shared it with. And so we've got some money just immediately coming in and going to uh, the Little Red Chapel. Well, it's that kind of little bit of networking among your friends. And I think that's a cool thing is uh, you're here, your interest is in it, your heart's in Coeur d'Alene and really happy to have you and just, you know, join us in, in sharing what you know um, and telling people that there's resources out there and we love their input as well. Anything else that we can talk about or answer any questions, last remarks. Uh, Hillary, is, I, I think we're kind of closing in on our time for this first meeting. Yes, I really appreciate everyone's time this evening and it was great with all the q and It was great to hear from our community members. Please take that survey if you haven't already and please send that link to everyone you know, like Katie and Spencer and Dave said, the more input we get, the better the plan is, and the better the council kind of see what's the, the desire of the community for historic preservation. Years ago, 20 years ago, I used to be on city council, I was on there for a while. And I was at a, a state meeting, and a guy 
tell, you know, early before pre-Zoom, the guy was from Boise and he was talking about, and as in talking to council members and city employees, and there was a guy and he said, there's a difference between a resident and a citizen. And that really struck a chord with me. And I've used, I've said this line countless times since then. And this is a great place for that. By showing up for here, you're citizens. You're not just people that live here. You're people that are involved with this community and uh, making this community as great as it is and continue to be great. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, spread the word. Watch for more. Participate. Thank you so much. And for the good of the order, thank you all for coming. And uh, stay tuned. We're going to have more. Good evening.